Hello there, and welcome to this edition of the Capital Update. Today, we are fortunate to have just the representatives with us from 33A and 33B. Welcome, Representative Hurtaz. Welcome, Randy. Thank you for having us. Thank you for being here. And Representative uh, thank Cindy you. Pugh, thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks so much, Randy. Happy to be here. So, And 33B, just so that everybody knows what's going mm -hmm. on. You know, I was uh, thinking about as I was driving into the show today about, you know, the last time we got together, and, and we're minus Senator um, mm -hmm. Osmick right now, um, but the last time we got here, you guys were just rolling out of session three months ago. And, and I have to say, honestly, looking at the both of you, you're refreshed and smiling again. So I, I'm happy that uh, you've nice. recovered from that long, arduous session that we had. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but as we were chatting a little bit the last time about the session and everything that was going on, it was interesting to me to watch what was happening in the economy and the numbers that we were hearing, hearing each quarter when they would release the numbers. And uh, it was positive news happening each time. And, you know, Jerry versus me running on, I'm actually going to turn it over to you and just have you reflect a little bit on, you know, though the session was dragging on, about the numbers that were coming out. Well, thanks, Randy. I uh, ran on a campaign uh, addressing the concerns that we maintain a vibrant and healthy economy here in Minnesota and that we grow our economy and that our revenues would grow by an expanded economy. And it's uh, clear that to me as a, as a business person as well that business owners really look for economic certainty. They look for predictability in terms of their business planning and how they're going to grow their business. And I think over the past two years, they were given that opportunity. And most of us know when we put down money and, and make an investment, it doesn't come back right away. It takes a little bit of time for water to run out of the end of the pipe, so to say. So with that in mind, uh, over the past two years, we've seen uh, Minnesota's economy fare better than the national economy in terms of the recession. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a very diverse economy and we have seen evidence that during this past two years, Minnesota was growing in a, in a in much better than, than the national economy. And there was plenty of promise and reason to believe that uh, things were going well. And as we were in session, we had uh, month after month gains in uh, excess revenue over the uh, budgeted forecast. So. That was the, the uh, positive thing going into it and in, in that we were on the right track. So did you have? Well, I have very little to add to that other than those um, excesses beyond the projection were as a result of the Republican-led legislature from the previous biennium. And this is, this is exactly, exactly you know, what, what we expected to have happen with the, um, you know, with the change in the trajectory from where we had been prior to the the Republicans being being in charge. And so we've already had one month now um, in the new um, biennium with the DFL budget, where in fact we have a 20, over a $20 million shortfall. So we're hopeful that that uh, won't, won't continue, but of course it's concerning. Right, I agree with you on that, Representative. I hope that is just mm -hmm. more of an enigma or an anomaly versus mm -hmm. a, a trend that's gonna be the opposite of what we have been experiencing mm -hmm. for the last 18 months since the policy that we just spoke about was put in place and the economy was starting to churn again. Right. So I, I personally know I don't want to see the, the economy slow down for anybody's purpose. Right. You know, th this is kind of a, a bit of a softball question and an easy question to, to come back to you guys at, but, you know, reflecting on the, the session that we just finished, mm -hmm. you know, there's high points and low points. Mm -hmm. Cindy, what was a low point for you for the last session? Well, um, there were several pieces of legislation that were, as I've termed, egregious. You know, um, I think one of the most concerning to me was the unionization of child care providers yes. and personal care attendants. I mean, these are small business owners. And my concern, of course, is that if it can happen to child care providers in that um, industry, it could happen elsewhere as well as a result of of government subsidies, um, and that's, that's of course a concern, and that's what I would have to say. Okay, and that, that was serious. I mean, that got mm -hmm. a lot of attention for more than just a day at the, at oh, the Capitol absolutely. as well. Mm -hmm. Representative Hurtas, how about yourself? What, what was the low point for you? Well, I think uh, the low point was the omnibus tax bill. Hmm. And, uh, you know, we experienced in Minnesota here a 9.99% increase in all funds spending, taxes and increases in spending, a total of not just $2 billion, as is commonly heard, but $6.12 billion uh, of all fund spending. That's stuff that's on the general fund ledger and all of those special dedicated funds that are spent uh, on behalf of, of different activities. 
So with all of that increase and with the month-over-month uh, -month revenue forecast coming in well above projections, it was just really a big overreach to uh, be raising taxes on hardworking families in Minnesota. And it's most troubling to me also to uh, corrupt the, uh, the message of fairness in terms of what is, what is fair and asking our highest income earners to actually uh, pay 25% more in personal income taxes. I didn't see anything fair about that at all. In fact, I argued and I uh, debated on the House floor that just because you levy a tax doesn't mean you're gonna collect it. And we're seeing very strong evidence now that we're sending our grandparents away from their children and their grandchildren that they're gonna relocate. And the, and the exodus has started, and particularly so right here in this district. We're seeing a number of uh, of uh, lake owners and whatnot that are simply going to stay in the southern climate an extra couple months. So Minnesota loses. Um, if these folks lose, we not only don't collect the extra tax that was being passed, we lose all of the base tax of their income for being a Minnesota resident. That just places an extra burden on everyone else who remains. You know, <clears throat> and once they leave, not likely to come back. Probably I mean, they, they've made a decision yeah. here. They may have been purchasing homes, or you know, or they had a second home and they've sold a home here. It, that, that's unfortunate. You know, oh. I we'll see how that actually plays out as well. I don't want to be an alarmist and say that you know there's a a stream of cars that all we're seeing is tail lights on right now. But it'll be interesting to see because we'll have real data in a year about how many have actually left. Yeah. Well, to that point. Um which was so, so well made, um, I argued that point on the floor as well and spoke on behalf of my constituency who um, has been making decisions um, about what to do to protect their businesses, to protect their hard-earned you know, uh, wealth, if you will. I mean, hard, hard-working Minnesotans that are being driven away from their, their families. This just isn't right. And you know, I had an opportunity during the session, as well as subsequently at a conference that I recently attended, to speak with um, an author, Travis Brown, of the book, um, How Money Walks. And I happen to bring a copy of it right here because I know that people are gonna wanna look this up. But it's really concerning how, how many dollars are moving out of our state to low tax states and capital capital does walk and I did sound the alarms to to Jerry's point on the floor that just because we levy a tax doesn't mean that that revenue is going to materialize but however the spending these egregious spending bills right. have already been passed and are in the works so if the revenue doesn't materialize we're gonna have some serious problems um, and, and uh, just a follow-up to that uh, how money walks uh, the most recent uh, report that I just read uh, is uh, claiming that Minnesota now has already lost $3.8 billion of taxable uh, income. Hmm. So if you take the marginal tax rate really, times yeah. that. That was with a B. Billion. <laughs> yeah, just to be billion clear with, that. with a B. And yeah. so that's quite a bit of money hmm. that will now have to be raised by the remaining taxpayers to meet that target. Hmm. Right, that is, that is disturbing to say the least. So to not keep going down the path, was there anything positive, Representative, that, that you, you walked away from that session thinking, I felt good about that? Well, you know, again, during the campaign, we talked about making reforms, making changes, making government more efficient. And uh, one of the things that certainly uh, was a very important issue to many of the constituents in our district is uh, education. I serve on the Finance Committee of Education, and one of the uh, positive changes that affects this district is we have four school districts that are overlapping school districts that have their district office just outside of the county line. And with that in mind, uh, many of their students, uh, most have more than half of their student base within the metro district. So one of the effective things that happened and I worked very hard for was to make sure that these school districts uh, got a, a, a better shake out of the uh, equity uh, location funding formula. So they're per pupil unit went up from $212 per pupil unit to $424 by simply uh, getting that piece of legislation changed so that they don't physically have to move their district office within the county line to receive sure. that revenue. That would be just another waste of taxpayer resources right. to move, the, move their office over the county line. So I think that's a positive thing. We also saw uh, some improvement with the schools, uh, safe schools levy 
Um, the money can be used for uh, uh, security purposes and enhancements to protect our children. And also that levy was increased by uh, about $6 uh, per pupil unit as well. So okay. that's some good things that happen and education matters a lot in our district and in the A side and B side mm -hmm. combined there's 11 school districts. So, You know I think it's important to say that again because you hear so often you know from the other side from the DFL that you know Republicans don't care about education and, and I've argued this in, in many points as well that how can you say that education makes up over half of our budget you know it, it's a priority and we're not trying to cut that, we're trying to make the most of it and make certain that it's the best product that we have out there. So I'm happy to hear that you, you went to bat for that and, and worked with that. Well, thanks. And uh, you know, one of, one of the pieces that I mentioned, I actually authored the bill and you know, I guess it's somewhat rare as a freshman legislator to uh, actually get something passed into law, but that um, did become part of the uh, omnibus education bill. Uh, for other reasons in the bill, I couldn't be dragged along to support the omnibus bill in its entirety, but there were some good things that I did believe in, and it did become law. Nice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Representative Pugh, did you have a high point? I definitely did, um, but I do want to comment that I think that uh, education is the number one issue um, amongst, amongst my constituents. So what, what did happen, a lot of what happened with the education w was, was really good. Um, my high point uh, would probably be the election reform that was done. I was um, really delighted. I was looking for something to vote for um, and election reform was something that I, I, could, um, I could cast a yes vote for. Um, the uh, poll book implementation that is going to be tested, I think will enhance election integrity. And there were some other changes that I feel good about too. You know, did it go as far as I would have liked to have seen it go to really ensure election integrity? Um, no, but it was definitely something that I could vote for and I was pleased to do so. Well, good, good. Well, why don't we take a break here for a moment and we'll come back. Okay. We're going to take a quick break here and we come back. We're going to continue this uh, discussion with Representative Pugh and Representative Hurtas. We interrupt this program to bring you this important message. The Lake Minnetonka Communications Commission, located in Spring Park, Minnesota, offers free television production classes. You heard it right. Free, free, free. free. Our friendly and knowledgeable staff will help bring your idea to the big screen. Why, thank you. We are very friendly and knowledgeable. From studio lighting and nonlinear editing to on location shooting, we'll guide you down the path you need to succeed. Hurry in, folks. An opportunity this good won't last forever. Well, welcome back. We figured we'd start this session talking about something a little bit different than how we ended the last session. You know, you guys are elected officials, but it's not like you're only in session. You're elected officials 12 months out of the year. And now that you're in session, I have to imagine that each of you are receiving a lot of correspondence from your constituents, from the, the great people of 33A and B, respectively. Mm -hmm. Representative Hurtas, you, you want to talk a little bit about some of the correspondence you may have had or something that's really sticking out with you from something you've heard from one of your people? Well, yeah, uh, thank you. And uh, really, there's uh, been a, a good deal of uh, volume of emails and uh, telephone calls and correspondence as a result of the uh, closing of the session. And, during this period of time uh, with not being down there uh, wee hours of the morning and it seems like everything gets done at the last minute. It was difficult to maybe uh, give all of the attention that you might want to to some of the communities and constituents as such. So I've been uh, trying to meet with uh, city administrators or at least have phone conversations with them and stopping out at, at some of the council meetings uh, affords an opportunity to do just that right now. But uh, with regard to some of the issues that are coming up, uh, I've gotten just recently uh, two or three emails about uh, issues or problems with uh, common uh, interest communities or homeowners associations. Uh, people have been concerned about that. I've got uh, another uh, concern. And, and are they concerned, Jerry, that they want you to put legislation in place or concerned about how the rules, current rules are affecting them? Yes, there, there is some uh, state laws as to uh, operations, but particularly uh, it's uh, how do uh, individuals who are members of a homeowners association resolve squabbles within their their own uh, common interest uh, community. So that's uh, been an issue that I was really quite surprised came up. But I've been I've gotten uh, two of them just in in this last week, and I had one earlier uh, in the year. In addition, uh, I had uh, another constituent uh, who uh, does international trading and importing of. Uh, products that are manufactured overseas for you know common business use and consumer use here in our district and 
they're having uh, their shipments uh, of containers being held up uh, more than 50% of the time mm -hmm. at the, at the uh, entry ports. Really? And each time these uh, containers are held over, sometimes they have to unpack them and then repack them, and it costs them up to $2,000 per container. Just for inspection? Just for inspection. So an uh, individual that I had a conversation with was concerned about the tens of thousands of dollars of additional costs that are going on when this has been a normal and everyday activity of, of their yeah. operation for decades. So that, that's been a concern there. And uh, you know, there's been a few other uh, miscellaneous things and just uh, with regard to local communities and their ordinances and whether or not you can uh, lend a, a helping hand in mediation of issues that sometimes people don't agree on. You know, you said something when you first started saying that, that I always appreciated when I was mayor, when, when your representative and senator came to, to visit you. I certainly think when you go to see them, and I hope both of you are going to be doing that or, or have been doing that, that you tell your local you know, council about those issues that some of their constituents are having because I know I think we all agree on this. You shouldn't be stepping in to resolve those problems. The council should be able to figure those out on their own because that's where the best control is, is at that local level. Yeah. And I hope that you are going to communicate that to them. Well, as a past mayor, I appreciated uh, maybe being relieved of some of those local right. uh, uh, issues that should be handled at the local level, but I'm always happy to help out wherever I can. And certainly I have an understanding and compassion for some of the, uh, you know, issues that come up with constituents regarding ordinances right. and laws. Right. So. so, Representative, thank you, Jerry. Yeah. Representative Pugh, how about you? You you are never short of getting correspondence in your mailbox. So. No, not at all. <laughs> in fact, the interim has just been very, very enjoyable um, and very, very busy, you know, surprisingly busy. Um, really enjoyed hearing what, what Jerry suggested um, his constituency is sharing with him. Those are really all different issues than, than what I've heard. Um, I've mostly heard from, from individuals and from groups. Um, I've met with both and have many more meetings planned who are advocating for issues in advance of the upcoming legislative session, of course. And I've also received a lot of correspondence from folks who are concerned about the legislation that has already passed and looking for clarification. You know, here we have a lot of new laws that have passed and there are people who are unclear about why something was passed, uh, you know, really what impact it might have on them. And so that's, that's most definitely something that I've been working on. I've also attended two legislative conferences. Um, as somebody who has never served in elected office before, I have um, some catching up to do compared to some of my colleagues who have had these experiences. And um, it's been fantastic. I'm scheduled to attend another um, next month. Okay. Women in government. Um, That's good. So I, I, I always love the, the passion that you have to get up to speed on things. I, I wish all, I mean, I know Jerry does this as well, but I wish all the, the sitting legislatures would take that passion to understand that there's a lot to learn and a, a lot of things that you should be doing to, yeah. to be up to There's thoughts. so much to learn. In fact, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to gather as much information as I can, um, irrespective of whether I serve on that particular committee or not. You know, I don't serve on an education committee, but I know that that's very important to my district. So I'm engaging on as many levels as I possibly can. So it's just been great. Perfect. You know, for the viewing audience, I just want to say this, and, and we'll edit this in. If you're on the A side or the B side of 33, please email Jerry or you know, Representative Hurtaz or, or Pew if you have questions, mm -hmm. because they want to hear from you. They, they do want to hear from you, and they like hearing from you. A mm -hmm. lot of people don't think that's the case, but you, know, you do represent sure. them. So your emails have, will be showing up underneath you here so that if they're in your area, you can start getting more emails. So Great. you're welcome. Sure. Great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, and and, and we, we welcome mm -hmm. as many uh, points of view we can about the issues. It, it helps us uh, get a better understanding of what our district is thinking. Perfect. I agree. Yeah. So, you know, um, earlier we were chatting about before we came on the air that now is the time of the session in the interim where the report cards start coming out to, to grade what happened in the last session. And, and they're all over the place, right? There's report cards that say A's, you know, 100% or whatever. And a lot of people don't understand this. And, and frankly, I don't always follow it either until you get in there and see how they're doing that. Jerry, you always seem to have a grasp on this kind of concept. Do you want to talk a little bit about the, re the report cards that we're going to start seeing? And Yes. Um, well, the report cards that have been coming out are basically uh, produced by special interest groups that have areas of concern about uh, issues that matter to their, their groups or their constituencies and whether it's about guns or whether it's about education or whether it's about health care, whether it's about uh, limited government, whether it's, you know, a, a libertarian type thing. 
Uh, there's all these different scorecards, and they've just really been coming out in the last couple of weeks. And uh, you know, the vote tallies are there, and and uh, you know, the Minnesota Taxpayer League just uh, announced uh, released one yesterday, I believe. And our own Senator Osmek was the only senator to uh, receive a perfect score uh, with regard to uh, protecting the taxpayer in that. Um, I guess you know, one of the things that that caught my attention in I looking at some of these scorecards. Americans for Prosperity, who believe in, in a more limited government, in, in personal responsibility, scored those bills or issues which are truly the legitimate functions of government, what government is supposed to be doing. And they had a scorecard uh, system of uh, A plus was a perfect score, and A was uh, almost perfect. Then they scored B, C, and D, and then D minus and F, just as F was not perfect, as A plus was perfect, and D minus uh, nearly, you know, not perfect. Right. And uh, so anyway, I was just looking at the tally, and one of the interesting things, and I really want to make an appeal to everybody in the district, mm -hmm. much of what we heard pr prior to the election is about the need to come together and compromise and solve the problems uh, that are facing constituents in the district and across all of Minnesota, and about working together to solve these problems. And if sometimes if you look at these scorecards, if a measurement of of, um, of being moderate or, or the ability to compromise or how you cast your votes. I uh, noticed in particularly with the AFP score that AFP, uh, AFP is the Americans Americans for, for Prosperity. Prosperity. Okay. Um, in, the, in the actual votes that they scored, out of 61 Republican legislators, there were uh, only eight perfect scores and about another dozen that were A scores, which means about one third of the caucus was you know, maybe far to that one side of the view or position about about uh, how strongly they feel about those goals. Um, on the other side, uh, to the to the extreme contrast, out of 73 uh, members of the majority, 70 of them uh, cast their votes at the D minus or F level. So. Uh, 70, what I'm, 70 out of 73 were D minus or D based on a scorecard that one third of Republicans were A or A plus. Right. So, so, so about yeah. about ninety percent, you know, were far to the left on this uh, scorecard issue, and about thirty percent of the Republicans were far to the right. And it does not matter uh, to me, and I'm not trying to exacerbate the issue of whether right. you're a Democrat or a Republican. But I really want to uh, present this information as a, the antithesis of what is oftentimes rhetorically said and what the reality is. And uh, the B's, C's, and D's, we even had a D in the Republican caucus, sure. but the B's and C's were predominantly owned by the other 40 uh, Republicans in the caucus, but only three Democrats had a better score than a D minus. So when it comes to partisanship, when it comes to compromise, uh, this scorecard, for example, proved that it's just really quite the opposite of what the other side was right. often saying about Republicans and yeah, about the unwillingness to compromise at all. Usually no, you see, no. I mean, we're still slanted to the one side, but at least a bell curve occurred. You yeah. know, slanted as it might have been. That, that's and, and if the scorecard were AFL, CIO, or or a, a union scorecard, uh, you know, the other side might be able to say the same thing about about what you know conservatives believe about the the sure. role of government as well. So, you know, in fairness to play, I, I'm sure that you know there are some of those other scorecards that that maybe uh, Republicans didn't do so well on. I, so, for one, didn't do well with the Minnesota Nurses Association. I'm a registered nurse myself, but I simply don't agree with a mandated uh, patient ratio, uh, regardless of the caseload or the condition of those patients. Sure. I just couldn't agree with those things. So you, you quickly go down in your score when you disagree with even those who share uh, some of your common interests. Right. There's a, a couple takeaways from that. When, when the residents of 33 start seeing these scorecards, they first should understand who's scorecard it is and what the criteria is behind before they start exactly you know before you know really understand so they understand better what it is like any scorecard right so mm -hmm. you know Cindy I don't know if you want to add something well I would I would just add ever so briefly that um, the the scorecards that Jerry mentioned specifically the Americans for prosperity that's really about economic you know economic prosperity and that's something that's very important to our our constituency right. our our district and you know, we, we scored 100% on, on that. And so our votes are consistent with our, with our district, and we're really proud about that. And another that uh, Jerry alluded to is the American, um, 
the uh, Minnesota majority, and it's really all about family values, and again, very reflective of oh. the majority within our Senate district. And again, um, we and our Senator Osmick um, scored 100% on that as well. So That's it's, great it, to hear. It is, it is good to hear. And for um, the residents as mm -hmm. well, too. Great to voters. see. Um, so, you know, as we start to wrap up the show here, I think there's something that we should talk about that's really kind of interesting because it doesn't happen but once in a lifetime for, for any of us. Yeah. We have something that's going to be commissioned here soon. Oh, yes. And I don't know which one of you want to oh. go ahead with that, but I don't want to tee it up. Okay. Well, um, you know, last March uh, I attend uh, another private organization meetings and there was a retired uh, commander from the U.S. Navy and he said to me, he said, I just want to give you a heads up, but there's going to be a commissioning this next fall uh, kind of save the date on your calendar because uh, there's going to be a commissioning of a, of a new ship in our uh, U.S. Naval Fleet that is honoring Minnesota. And uh, many of you may have heard about the commissioning of the USS Minnesota, but the new USS Minnesota is going to be our nation's newest nuclear attack submarine. And uh, the oh, submarine. submarine. And the entire legislature was uh, invited to a go as well as uh, many other retired members of the military. And there's going to be a pretty uh, large contingent of Minnesotans that will be there for this commissioning ceremony on Saturday, September 7th. Sorry, Wyzetta, I won't be there for your uh, parade, yeah. right. but, uh, but nonetheless, uh, going, going to uh, be going to the commissioning. Yeah. And it should be noted that there have only been three, three USS Minnesotas in the Navy in history. The first one was uh, defending the uh, USS uh, Molitor uh, during the Civil War. And you might have uh, read last spring that uh, they had found the wreckage of the USS Molitor and they found a couple Navy men still aboard. So they exhumed those bodies and they received a proper burial this spring. Yeah. Another one was uh, a battleship or, uh, or a frigate. I'm not sure which one it was uh, during World War I. That ship has been decommissioned. And so and lastly now we have our third USS Minnesota. So it sounds like a real exciting thing. And there was a contest to create a new logo. And there's a young man from Roseville that uh, won the design of the logo for our U.S. battleship. And as part of the prize for uh, winning the logo, he actually gets to attend oh, the commission. What an honor. Exciting. So, that is yeah, so exciting. I'm, I'm jealous. I yeah. wish I could draw more than Stickman. I would have been and uh, <laughs> the taxpayers should know that everybody's going at their own expense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was going to add that. So, so, uh, and you're going as well? I am. Your... And, look, and looking, forward, looking forward to this as well. well. It's really an honor and a privilege to have been invited. And I look forward to being there. So please take some photos. And yep. when we have you back here in a few months to start mm -hmm. talking about what's coming coming up on the next session and what we see happening in, in 2014. Um, have some photos so we can look at that because most people we can see them online but you'll have a different vantage point. So great. I want to thank you both for being on the show today. It was a lot of great information and um, again thanks for taking time out of your day to be here. Well, thank you Randy. Thank you, Randy. And, and I, I would also add uh, to all the folks at home, uh, please feel free to contact us about anything that is of a special concern or issue to you. Perfect. Yeah. And thank you all for joining us today. Remember, when you want to know what's going on up at the Capitol, join us right here on Capitol Update.